Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. I was here last year. Uh, absolutely love Switzerland. Um, Gerard's a pretty funny guy. He likes to make jokes. Uh, he, he insulted Swiss chocolate the other day. On just, and like this, does this even work? I'll just do this. This happened. <laughs> so he got, he, got, he got knocked down. Don't mess with Switzerland. Um, it's really, this was just a circumstantial photo. I don't know what, what, Matt, what Matty was doing, but, and Gerard's getting up like an old man. And, uh, but yeah, it looks like Matty was just like, dude, whoa, what up? It's pretty good. Uh, so yeah, I'm Ben Lesh. I, I work as a software engineer at Google. Uh, I used to work at Netflix with a few of these other folks, including Brian Holt. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Ben Lesh, uh, GitHub, same, same nickname. Uh, so this is a talk again about advanced RxJS. Uh, I'm going to just gloss over what RxJS is here. I've done a lot of talks on very beginner-based stuff in, in Rx, and I'm excited about this talk because I'm going to talk about doing some more advanced things. I don't expect everyone here to be able to follow along. It's fine. You can, you can catch me afterwards, and I, I'll, I'm happy to answer any questions. This, this talk's a little bit more for people that might have used RxJS a little bit. But just to, to gloss over what RxJS is, uh, as, as Brian stated in his talk, ArcGIS is Lodash for events. It's, it's a set of, of uh, operations and whatever that you can do uh, to, to control events as sets of things. So ArcGIS is about observables and operators. Um, you can find inf more information at a few of these spots. There's, there's ArcGIS uh, 5 on GitHub. That's where the repo is, is at this spot at, at ReactiveX slash ArcGIS. The docs are at the ReactiveX IO web website. And then the, you can actually look up the TC39 observable proposal at, at the bottom link there on, on GitHub. Uh, as as uh, Brian had mentioned, it's, a, it's stage one. I think they're pushing for stage two very, very, very soon. Uh, but RxJS 5 is a reference implementation of this proposal. There's, there's some minor differences, but it's, it's made to match the observable that might uh, land in the browser someday. So ideally, you know, I, would have, I would get to stop supporting you know, writing the observable part. I could just let the browser handle that. So an observable, what an observable is, just a really quick version, is it sets of values over time. Um, so you, you subscribe to an observable, and when you subscribe to it, it takes the observer that you've given it, or it takes a bunch of functions that you've given it, makes it, wraps it in an observer, and, which is just an object, and then ties that ob observer to something that's producing data, whatever that is. It could be a for loop over an array, could be a WebSocket, could be anything. Um, and then on completion, or when, when someone says, I want to unsubscribe from this thing, because it gives you a subscription back, or, or when it completes, it's able to tear that down. So you can use kind of expensive things like WebSockets and close them when you're done. Um, or in this case, we're going to be talking about animations. You can do things like uh, abruptly stop an animation or something like that. But the most important part about this is that observables are sets. This is why they're powerful. So. Uh, you know, this is, I don't know how many folks here have ever, like, looked into things like category theory. If sometimes you hear, hear people get up, they'll talk about observables, and I, I've sworn that I would never say these words in a talk, but they'll say things like monad, monoid, these sorts of things. These are just names of, of sets that have certain properties. That's it. There's, like, uh, a, a, for example, a monoid is, is just a set that you can concatenate and has an identity property. So an array falls under this category, you can concatenate arrays together, an empty array concatenated to an array, you come back with the same array, so that's an identity. Uh, the, when you hear those sorts of words, it's, it's just someone um, trying to sound smart. I'm not going to do that anymore. Um, but the, the, the thing about it is they're sets. And because they're sets, and because uh, brilliant mathematicians have come up with all these wonderful things you can do with sets, we have all sorts of great things you can do with sets. You can transform them. And that's just what operators are. So operators are just functions, really, that transform one observable, one set, into another observable, a different set. So you can map and filter and flatten and uh, do some of these other wonderful things, join them. Um, so really, to think reactively, when people think about reactive programming, usually it's explained as, uh, let's, let's some, some event fires, and then I react to that event, and then I fire another event, and then something else reacts to that event. It, when, you're, when you're talking about it with RxJS, you're really, uh, what you want to do is think about transforming sets. You start with some, one set of events, and you try to transform it into the set of events that you actually want. 
But this talk is actually about animations. Um, I'm excited about this because I, I do talk a lot about RxJS. This is like all I talk about when I come to these conferences. And, and uh, the, the thing is, I'm always up here and I'm like, you know, uh, animations, like what are the major sources of, of sets of events in your app? There's Ajax, there's user interactions, there's animations, there's web sockets, and so on. And then I go on to show examples of user interactions, web sockets, Ajax, all these other things, and I, I rarely, rarely ever touch on animations. Um, and you know, animations are sometimes viewed in the development community as a little bit of fluff, like it's not the important part of your app, it's, it's not the functional part of your app. There's talks about why it is important, there's some wonderful talks about that uh, by I think Sarah Drasner and some other folks, but um, it's, it's, it's also technically interesting, and we're gonna get into the technical side of, of doing these with RxJS. So there's different methods of creating animations in an application. Uh, the, the first one a lot of people go for nowadays is CSS. You can do some cool stuff with uh, like CSS transitions and keyframes and, and other great things. Uh, and then also there's a lot of ways to do this with JavaScript. There's raw JavaScript, just like go in and I'm gonna uh, use you know, animation frame or set interval. Back when I first started, people would use set interval or set timeout and, and you know, physically move the DOM element. Uh, there's the web, the web animation API. I think this is really only available in, in Firefox right now. I don't think it's actually made it through its entire proposal process for uh, what is the what WG is the, the standards body for that. Um, there's jQuery. A lot of people have used jQuery to animate. That was one of the things that made jQuery really popular, I think, is like, wow, look at this. I can make stuff move, and it's one line of code, right? Uh, D3, used for a lot of data visualizations, GreenSock, and just so many more. There's tons and tons of libraries. Uh, all, most of these, these other JavaScript methods and, and also the CSS methods, you can just use them like normal and kind of wrap them in an observable. And that's just wrapping an a API in an observable. That's the same thing you do with a WebSocket or anything. I'm not really gonna focus on that so much. What I'm gonna focus on in this talk is using raw JavaScript and just RxJS to create these animations. So it's, what is an animation? Uh, animation, if you look up the, def the definition, um, is the, the technique of, this is the actual definition, the technique of photographing successive drawings or positions of puppets or models to create and illustrate, to, to create an illusion of movement when the movie is shown as a sequence. Uh, so it's, it's pretty clear we want to deal with sets. I keep talking about sets of things. So I can see by this definition that we've got a set. We've got a set of puppets over time, right? No, maybe not puppets. Positions over time is, is really what we're concerned with in, in web development. So what this actually looks like if you were to kind of just take snapshots of an animation is this really primitive here. You, you would see if I'm moving some, an object, I'm moving this little ball, it's going to move, it starts at position zero and then goes to position one and so on. You can represent this as an observable. I've got this completely synchronous observable of zero, one, two, three at the bottom. Uh, same thing for rotation. You're just changing degrees over time. So you can say have an observable of those degrees. And scale, it gets a little bit more interesting when you do more than, more than one, right? So you can, you can scale it in two directions. But basically, since every one of these, the, the width and height is exactly the same, I could you know, kind of narrow that down to the same sort of observable. But you get the idea. Moving to two directions, same thing. It's just you've got values over time. And that's precisely what observables are. We need values over time. But every, all the observables I just showed you at the bottom, when you say observable of and some values, and then you were to subscribe to that, it would just play them all like that, like you're looping over an array. It's, it's, it doesn't have that, that temporal element. It doesn't have the element of time in it. And we need that for animations, and that's where it gets tricky. So there's, there's really two elements of time that I want to talk about when it comes to animations. And these are not formal definitions. I didn't go out and look up some uh, collegiate version of a definition of animations and the types of time involved. This is just my breakdown of this. There's one type of time that you want to deal with, which is your frame rate. And uh, the, other, the other thing you want to deal with is some sort of duration or velocity. So let's talk about frame rate really quick, or what a frame is. So a frame is just a moment in time at which to just adjust the position of something before you re-render it. So it's, it's, it, they, you have many, many, many frames to make up a movie. As I'm sure you've seen a film strip before, and there's multiple frames in a film strip. That's, that's all a frame is. And to get a frame, an appropriate frame, in a modern web browser, um, you use request animation frame. 
This is the API for request animation frame. You call it, you give it some sort of callback that will actually be fired when the browser says, uh, basically when you call this, it's telling the browser, I want to do some sort of animation. Browser, when you're, when you're ready, when you're not too busy and you're about to, do a, a, about to do a render cycle, right before that, let me run some code so I can make some updates so I can, I can schedule this to, to be rendered and, and updated and make a movement. Uh, so you call request animation frame, it can give you back an ID, you can cancel it later if, if, you, if you choose, so it's kind of like a set timeout, sort of. Uh, RxJS 5 actually has a scheduler that wraps this, that actually handles this for you. Uh, I'll get to what schedulers are in just a second, but it, it's, you can find it in rx.scheduler.animation frame, and it's, it's just this really simple API, it's got a schedule met method and a next method. When you call schedule, you provide it a function that you want to fire on the animation frame and it returns back an RxJS subscription that you can call unsubscribe on later if you want to cancel the animation frame for some reason. It's, it's actually really rare that you'll end up um, using schedulers raw like this in, in, in Rx, but I just want to show kind of what the API is. So what a scheduler is in Rx is schedulers just control the timing of when your observable events fire. So an observable, Again, when you subscribe to it, you give it some callbacks, and, it, and it's, you, it'll fire your next callback every time it has a new value, or if it gets an error, it'll, it'll fire your error callback, and so on. So this actually controls when those things are allowed to fire. So if your observable says, hey, I've got a new value for you, I'm gonna next this at you, and it's, and it's being controlled by a scheduler, it will wait for the scheduler to, to allow that value to come through to the, the error handler. So it's, schedulers are kind of a gating mechanism. Um, because you, won't, you don't want to just play it right now. What we want to do, ideally, in this situation is, oh, wait until there's an animation frame. Now give me the value, because I'm ready to make some changes to my view. Um, so using schedulers in RxJS is, is pretty straightforward. It's, it's available in most observable creation methods as the last argument. Now, schedulers are not something that's part of the TC39 proposal at all. Uh, I, I, I wish it was because then I wouldn't have had to write a scheduler at some point. I could stop maintaining it and there would just be one natively. But it's always, it's always the last argument to these creation methods. And basically it just says, you know, this, this observable, whenever, whenever you subscribe to it, wait until the scheduler says it's okay to subscribe and then execute the subscription. Whenever, whenever this observable fires a value at me, wait until the scheduler says it's okay and let the value through. Again, a gating mechanism. There's also some operators available in Rx5 uh, to, to uh, use scheduling, so you can take any arbitrary observable and say, I want you to observe on this schedule, which is, you know, fire your events on this particular schedule. I want you to subscribe on this particular scheduler. Um, not really important for this, this talk, but just so you know that that's another way you can use schedulers if you want to try them out. There's a few different schedulers. Uh, these, are, these are the ones that currently exist. Animation frames, the one we'll be dealing with today. There's a queue scheduler, which is like a breadth first sort of thing to keep you from getting stack overflows. ASAP is the next job or microtask, so that's the same as like a promise. So that, that's always gonna beat set timeout zero if you, do, uh, if you use the ASAP scheduler at, at zero. And then async, which is just the same as set timeout. Uh, so if you were to say async schedule zero, it's gonna, it's gonna uh, do like a set timeout zero, basically. Um, but again, animation frame wraps request animation frame. That's the one we want to use. So back to frames. So what we, what we want to do is we want to create like an observable of frames because that's when, you, when you're doing reactive programming, you start with a set of things. If we started with a set of frames, then maybe we can somehow transform that into a set of, of transformations we want to make to the view because it's, they're all going to happen as soon as, as, soon as this, the, whatever's at the head of this fires, it's going to go all the way through synchronously and, and you know, you're going to try to manipulate this into a different set of values that you're going to use to update the DOM. So this is one way to do it. So there's, there's an observable creation method called observable range and you provide a start and an end. So if I wanted to create a value, an observable of 0 through 9, I could say uh, you know, range 0 to, to 10, so it's giving me 10 values after 0 and, it, and you, you get this instantaneous observable range of 0. Now, if I was to just say observable range, zero to number positive infinity, and I subscribe to this without scheduling, it's just gonna lock the browser. It's basically a for loop that's the upper bound of is infinity. Um, I don't have time to wait to see if that's gonna complete, so we use, we use an animation frame. Animation frame is then gonna say, yeah, I want an infinite number of these, sure. 
But each one of them, I want you to wait for the next animation frame. So there's going to be a pause between, between there. It's not going to lock up your browser. Uh, and it's, it's going to wait for the next animation frame. So this is going to give you an observable of 0, 1, 2, and so on, frame numbers uh, uh, that happen at, on animation frame. Uh, another way to do the same thing, and this is my preferred method, is to use observable interval. So you say observable inter interval 0, and then you run animation frame. And, and it's identical. It's the same thing. It's going to give you frames of 0, 1, 2, and so on when animation frame fires. So we can we can actually take this and um, we can actually take this and just run it. We could just say, well, every time the frame changes, let's just change the position of something. So it's going to move one pixel every time an animation frame fires. That's what it looks like. Eh, not very exciting, but at least we got the ball to move, right? Um, and this this isn't this isn't great. This isn't great because I did this on kind of an old MacBook Air, so the ball moved at that speed. If I was to go grab, uh, you know, say Brian's brand new MacBook and, and run the same thing, the MacBook Pro, it's going to go and fly right off of there because he's got a much faster processor. This, this, uh, the problem with request animation frame is it's non-deterministic. You're waiting for the browser to say, I'm not busy. So if your app is a really busy thing, what's going to end up happening is uh, it's going to wait a long time between request animation frames. You might get four frames in a second. Maybe you get 60 frames in a second. So you don't want to animate by frame number. That's, that's not great. We have to do something better than that. Um, but at least now we've got that temporal side of things handled. We've got an observable of frames. So let's, let's talk about doing something with this that makes it a little bit more usable. Let's talk about the other side of the, the time equation here, which is velocity or duration. So both of these things are related, and they're related through a very, very simple uh, a very simple algorithm I think everybody has probably seen in grade school, which is velocity is distance divided by time. Right? So time being the, the duration here, technically. So if you, if you know any two of these things, you can figure out the other one, right? Uh, but when we were talking about animating by velocity of dura or duration, we're kind of taking different angles on this. So the, the simplest one that I'll start with is just animating by velocity. And what I mean by this is I want you to move by V units over T amount of time, so move by so many pixels per second or so many pixels by, per millisecond or so many inches per, per minute or whatever. It's, it's, it's just you're giving it, like, I'll, here's the speed at which I want this, this ball to move or this thing to rotate or this whatever to fade out. And you don't know, you're not giving it a time for how long it's going to take. You're, you're saying this could last forever. So this is really good for never-ending animations like uh, games that are running or uh, loading spinners, that sort of thing. Uh, the other one is, just, just to, to contrast it, animate by duration. That's, that's to move you know, x uh, by, by, you want to move some x distance over t amount of time. So you know how far you want to go, and you know what, how, how long you want it to take, and then you have to figure out the velocity, right? Uh, and that's better for more, that's more useful for what I think most of us work on as far as apps go, because then you're talking about, I want to move this thing from here to here, it's, like, it's great for transitions, for data visualizations, that sort of thing. So we need to build a more useful frames observable. So we, we've got this frames observable that just gives us frame numbers, but we can already know we don't really want to animate by frame number. Uh, it might be useful for some sort of logging or something, but it's, other than that, uh, it's, not, it's not that useful. Um, so what we can do is we can actually get an observable of time passed for each frame. So we take the exact same, uh, the exact same observable we had before. So this is our, our, our observable of animation frames, or frame numbers. And what we can do is we can say, well, let's, let's get this. Um, I got the, frame, the frames out of order. So we get, we get a start uh, for like right now. We'll just take a timestamp for whenever we're going to start this observable. And then we're going to just do some really simple math and figure what the difference is uh, at, each, at each animation frame. Like, how, how many milliseconds has it been since I've started this observable now? Um, but there's, there's a little problem with this, which is uh, this, this thing here is, is all going to run. It's going to get that timestamp before you're actually subscribed to your observable. So here's a little trick with uh, observable defer. Uh, I don't see people use this a whole lot, but it's, it's a very, very powerful uh, method in, in RxJS, which is just saying, I'm going to create an observable that where I'm going to execute the body of this function here, and I'm going to return to you this observable on the bottom. So when I subscribe to the resulting observable from this observable defer, it's going to actually 
get that timestamp for start, and then it's going to return this other observable that is using that, that timestamp internally. Uh, I can make this slightly more useful by, by creating a higher order function of it. So if, you, if you're not familiar with a higher order function, really it's a, it's a function that makes a new function. So it's a, it's a way to, to uh, get some more reusability out of, out of useful functions. You're going to see that a lot in this talk. So this is just saying, you know what, maybe I, don't, maybe I want to test this later with a test scheduler or something. So I'm going to actually provide the scheduler, but I'm going to default it to the animation frame scheduler. So most of the time I'm not actually going to pass a scheduler in, but just in case I want to test this later, I'm, I'm going to provide it in, in this manner. So now I have this uh, milliseconds elapsed function that will give me an observable of, of uh, time that's, as it's passed since I've subscribed. So if I, want to, uh, if I want to actually move something by a velocity, I can set some velocity. In this case, I've, I've got this velocity named pixels per second. And what I can do is just some simple math. I can, I can take the, um, the milliseconds of time passed, and then I know it's milliseconds, but I have pixels per second. So I'm going to divide those milliseconds by 1,000, and then multiply it by my pixels, pixels per second. And now I've got an observable of how far should I move this object, right? I can make that into a higher order function, too, to make it more useful. Again, I, I, mean, I told you you're going to see a lot of this. So now I have a pixels per second uh, function instead of just a, a constant value where you can provide the velocity you want, and it's going to return to you a, a function that you can use inside that map. So this is doing exactly the same thing. We're saying, uh, over the time elapsed, I want to move by 50 pixels per second. So the, just to demo this, is the exact same code. Now it's moving at 56. 50 pixels per second. Um, it's a more controlled rate. If I was to run this on Brian's brand new laptop, it would still move at the same pace. If I was to run this on a really janky old laptop, as long as it supported the browser supported all the features that I'm using, uh, it's, it's going to run, but you might see it jump, but it's still moving at roughly 50 pixels per second. So it's always going to be where you, where, where you would expect it to be uh, at that velocity. So just a quick recap on velocity-based animations, because that's all there is to it. They're very, very simple. It's a set of time. You get a, you get a set, of, set of time differences on animation frame, and then you want to map those time differences into, into position differences based off of some simple math around velocity. Uh, these, these are easily the, the, the simplest way to play with animations is just, let's see if I can move this by so much over, so, uh, over a certain amount of time. But that brings us to the more useful version of animations, which is duration-based animations. So we, we could just take what we did with velocity and just add a take while, right? This is going to do this, the same basic thing. Uh, it's, it's saying, move by this velocity, but just take, take all of, the, take all of the, the milliseconds elapsed while they're less than two seconds, let's say, and then do, do your movement. So you move at this velocity for this long. So this, this, is, gonna, this is one way to do it. But uh, I, I'm going to go ahead and say that I don't think this is necessarily the best solution. It's a solution. It's a very simple solution. If it works for you, great. Uh, but I think we can do a little bit better. So what if, what if all the duration-based animations were the, were the same? We know, we know that durations obviously always have a start. They always have an end, because uh, it's just a segment of time. And it's, they're all, all we have is numbers. Right, so we've, we've, we can say, you know, one second's passed, two seconds passed, and so on, or however many milliseconds have passed. Like we, so we have sets of numbers, and numbers can be easily transformed and scaled. So I think we should try to treat them as percentages. And what I mean by percentages are decimal values between 0 and 1. So now I know if, if you give me a duration of 10 seconds or you give me a duration of 5 milliseconds, if I'm, if I'm getting a, a whole bunch of, of animation frames uh, what I want is I want to know that it's always going to be values between 0 and 1, because that, that gives me some flexibility in what I can do with this observable. I always know that it's, set, its range of values is going to be between a, a certain, certain range. So let's build this duration observable. And what we're going to do here is we're going to take our milliseconds elapsed function, the same one we made when we were working on velocity, and we're just going to map it by saying we have this duration function where we provide this, this ms variable. This is the duration. This is how, we, how long we want our animation to last. And we're just going to take the, the, uh, the amount of time that's elapsed and divide it by the, the milliseconds we want the duration to be. 
Right? Very simple math, and then we just say, take it while it's less than or equal to one. So now we, we, we can still pass the scheduler through, just in case we want to provide that. It's the same thing, uh, just in case we want to test it later. Uh, very simple. But what we, end what we end up with is this uh, range of values. So you see along the bottom here, it starts at zero, and then you get some kind of arbitrary uh, decimal amounts as animation frames fire, again, non-deterministically, and then eventually you, you get a one at the end. So moving over a distance then becomes very, very simple multiplication. If I'm saying that my duration is, is, is done when you get the value one, then if the distance I want you to travel over that duration is 300 or whatever, you just multiply one by 300, right? It's, it's, you can just multiply uh, the, the, the percentage it's gone by the distance. So if right now the, the, it, the frame I'm at is, say, 0.5, we're halfway through our duration, then 0.5 times our distance of 300 is going to be 150. It'll be at the 150 pixel mark. It's exactly where we want it to be. So very, very simple math, just some multiplication. Again, we can do a higher order function with this. So instead of having a distance uh, constant that's set to a specific distance, we could actually make this into a function that takes a distance and then returns the, the, uh, the function that we want uh, that multiplies that distance times, times the, the time that's elapsed, or the percentage of time that's elapsed. And we provide that to our mapping function. So down at the bottom, we're saying, over the duration of two seconds, I want you to... Uh, give me a range of values between 0 and, and 300. So if we go ahead and we use this, and this is, again, we're just going to move our ball again with exactly the same observable. It moves a certain amount and then stops. So that, that moved 300 pixels over 2 uh, seconds, or 2,000 or milliseconds. Here's why I wanted to make this percentage-based. So moving things in just a kind of plain, boring line is, is great and all, but it's, it doesn't have the pizzazz that a lot of people like to see in their apps. Uh, most of the time, people see these nice uh, animations where things will kind of bounce into place, or they'll, they'll slowly come in and, like, and like cruise to a stop, or they'll speed up and accelerate in, or whatever. They, these, these things are called easing. This is, this is so you're, you're saying, I've got this animation. I want to ease it in a certain way. Uh, or like an elastic one or something like that. So if our duration observables are always uh, 0 to 1, uh, no matter how long the duration is, uh, then another thing to think about is you can also represent distance traveled. If, if you've got a specific distance you want to go, you can represent that by a percentage, right? If you want to go, uh, I almost said 5 miles because I'm American, but if you want to go 5 kilometers, right, you, you could say, I, I, when I'm starting, I'm at zero. When I get to five kilometers, I'm at one. If I'm at you know, two and a half kilometers, I'm at 0.5, and so on. Like you, can, you can scale, because it's just numbers. You can scale any number in this manner. Um, so we can represent distance in the same way, and that's really what an easing function does. So now the, the values might, if you have, say, an elastic, uh, an elastic easing function, it might go over one a little bit, because it's going to go past the point it's supposed to go and then eventually come back, right? So this is, this is what we're going to do. We're going to transform our duration of time into a uh, kind of percentage of distance traveled over that time. And we're going to do that, this again with easing functions. The, the easing functions that you're going to see come from this GitHub repository at the bottom by uh, Matt DESL. Uh, I like these. They're, they're also based on Rob Penner's easing functions. Uh, you can follow Rob Penner on Twitter. Like Every easing function you've ever probably seen used was uh, kind of pioneered by this guy. Um, he's really, really an int interesting guy to follow on Twitter. Very nice guy, too. Uh, but the, so this elastic out method, uh, again, came from that, that, uh, that eases repo. And I've, I've modified it a little bit to be an arrow function. But all it does is it just takes a value and transforms it to another value. It takes a value between 1 and 0 and transforms it to another value that's roughly between 1 and 0. And this is an elastic out. So that means it's going to go and kind of wiggle to a stop. And we can use this by simply using a map in, 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 uh, in uh, Rx. You just map that duration to this, this distance traveled. Uh, but it's really important that you do that before you do the distance, because again, it's expecting values between 0 and 1, right? If you do it after the distance, you're going to get values, in this case, between 0 and 300. And that's it's not going to work out quite right. 
So just to show what this does is now this is a little bit more exciting, right? And all we did is just, to, just add one simple function. It's composed in there. You could comment it out. We could do a different mapping function, whatever you like. So you can make animations more reusable. And you can make them even more reusable than what I'm showing here with the, with the higher order function type methodology that I keep, I keep uh, illustrating. But um, we could do things, for example, like you could move the rendering side effects to a do block. And that's going to make your animation more reusable because that means you've got this observable that now it actually is controlling the side effects when you subscribe to it. Uh, you could allow passing the duration right to, to the entire animation, make a higher order function that wrapped the whole animation that you built. Uh, but again, the, the idea is you, you, you want to use higher order functions to get more reusability out of it. So if we want to make this particular animation, this is the one we just did, uh, slightly more reusable, we could do something like this. Well, now we have this, this move ball function that takes a, that takes a, a duration uh, observable. So now I could, I could give it any duration I want. I could say, um, you know, give me a duration of 10 seconds, an observable, a duration observable of 10 seconds, or a duration observable of half a second, or whatever. And I can pass it into this function, and it's going to return to me uh, an observable I can subscribe to to perform the animation. Uh, and then you see it used at the bottom. I'm saying move ball, and I'm passing in that observable. So here's, a, here's an example of this. This seems scaled way off. I don't know if this is going to animate. Yeah. So it's exactly the same thing. It still, it still works. But let's see. Uh oh, am I going backwards? What happened? Uh oh, I have duplicates. I think I'm going the wrong direction. <laughs> Anyways, sorry for that. Um, yeah, this is exactly the same. Even more reusable. Here we go. So we can make this even more reusable by using an, uh, another higher level function that says, well, what if I what if I don't always want it to animate that same ball? What if I want to tell it which ball I want to animate. Well, you can just make that an even uh, uh, another higher order function, where now I call it by saying move, move down. I give it the ball that I want to animate with, which is a, just like, a, in this case, it's a div, um, a div element. And then you pass a duration to it, and then you subscribe to the result of that. But we can make that a little bit better with RxJS. So this is exactly the same code. But down at the bottom, I want you to notice that I'm, now I'm using let instead of calling things this way. What let is, is let allows you to give it a function that takes an observable and returns a new observable. So a let is a, an operator in RxJS that kind of lets you compose things more in a, a left to right or top to bottom sort of way. So this, this, is gonna say, this basically says, over the duration of two seconds, uh, let's, let's move down, what do we want to move down, this, this ball, and then we subscribe to it and it should work. So let's run that. And now we can, now we can run more than one animation at the same time. These are all different divs that we're moving with the exact same animation. And I'm using a merge map with this in order to coordinate them to all run at the same time. Now, without changing very much, you can, you can now use the power of Rx to sequence animation. So I didn't change much here. All I did was change the merge map to a concat map. And what a concat map does is it says, hey, let's, play, let's, let's map to a new observable. Uh, and play that one and not, not do the next one until that one's done. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to run them in sequence. So if I, if I run this, this one, even though I changed about, oh, six characters, it's going to run them in order. And I did, a, I did another little thing here, which is I'm using the index to kind of augment that duration every time, like, which you see down in line 43 at the very bottom. So again, as they, as they play, they get a little slower each time. And I'm just, but I'm still reusing the same animations that I built earlier. So this, that's duration-based animation. So uh, a quick recap on that is that you, you want to create a duration observable that, that takes your duration and represents it as a percentage. So the value is between 0 and 1. Uh, and what, what you want to do then is you want to, you want to map that uh, to a distance. You can use easing functions to do this, but a percentage distance, if you're using easing functions, if you don't want to change the distance traveled over time with easing, then you just skip that map step and you run it uh, directly. But then you, it's just simple multiplication to, to calculate the, the, the distance. And then again, to make these things more reusable, you want to use higher order functions in order to 
you know, just be able to change or tweak little bits and pieces of it so you can kind of functionally compose these, these interesting things. But duration animations are all well and good. Duration animations, like mostly what you'd see for a duration animation is things like in D3 you might see, uh, you know, some elements are changing over time and every time they change, you want to, instead of just having it jump, you want it to smoothly move to the next uh, value that it's supposed to be set at. So, you know, in honor of, of being in Switzerland, I made this really primitive clock. And this, is, this has no animations. This is just, I used Rx to, um, used Rx to just have this, this timer, and the timer is, is changing values over time. It's saying 0, 1, 2, and so on. And I'm mapping it to degrees uh, to kind of divide it by 60 and just have it uh, tick around in a circle, I, I'm, I'm rotating it. So this is just, this isn't any of the animation stuff I showed you before. It has maybe the illusion of animation because you see it moving, but it's not really moving, it's, it's actually just kind of jumping to the next spot, right, as it goes around. It would be a lot cooler if we could make this kind of smoothly go to the next thing. So what we can take is we, we can use what we've already built and we can make some tw a tween function. Uh, so in order to make a tween function, I've, I've kind of busted this into two functions. The top one is, the, is called prev and current. So this is, gonna, this is gonna take an observable stream of values and make it into an observable stream of arrays that the first argument is the previous value and the next argument is the current value. And the reason we need that is we need to know how far to move our, our, our uh, whatever, our, our second hand in this case. We need to know how far to move that thing and in order to know that, we have to know where it was at and where it's going. So this, that's just a, a simple, a, a very simple transformation there. It's, I'm saying start with some initial value, and then I use a buffer count uh, with two and one, and that's going to give us these, these arrays of, of two values. Again, an observable of arrays that previous value, current value. And then after that, down here I've got uh, this tween function. Tween is going to say, give me some milliseconds of how long I want this to last. Give me an easing function, which is our little elastic thing that we're, we, want, we like to do. And then we say, give us some, some source, some source observable. And our source observable is expected to be uh, you know, a duration. And we're going to say, uh, let pre and current, so we're, we're saying, give us the previous and current values of, of the, I'm sorry, the source. The source observable is actually the source of values that you want to change between. We, we get the previous and the current values from that. So now we have a set of previous and current values. And then I'm going to use switch map. And switch map is going to say, create this animation. Down, down in here in the bottom, you see duration, map, map, map. That, that part is our animations. Like just what I showed you in the previous example, we're going to use that inside the switch map. And it's basically going to say, uh, you know, over this, over this duration, we want to map with this, with this easing. And then we want to move by this distance. The distance, as you can see, is calculated by, sub by subtracting the, the next or the current value from the previous value. And then we, we also want to add the, the previous value to the value that came out of that as well, because you want it to start from where it was before it moves to the next spot. Otherwise, it's going to jump back and then go, and jump back and then go. That's not what we want. And then to use it, we use our let operator again, and we just call tween, and we provide it a the milliseconds and what easing function we want to use. And this is exactly the same now. Like this, this tween function is reusable. You'd only re rewrite that, you'd only write that one time. Uh, I've, I've, I think I've got repositories out that have this exact same uh, tween function that you could use if you like, but it's, it's, it, you never have to write that again. Now anywhere you want to add this tweening behavior and some observable stream of values, you would just use let, you'd give it a duration of how long you want the tweening behavior to last, and you'd give it some easing function that you want it to use. And then, other than that, it's exactly the same as, as the previous observable. We just kind of declaratively added it in there. So to see what this looks like now, it's going to be a little bit smoother. So it's still going to tick along, but you notice it has a little movement, and it kind of rocks back and forth like a, like a real crappy, not Swiss watch might, right? <laughs> um, it's my Timex. Uh, but yeah, it's, it, it looks a lot nicer. It actually has the illusion of movement. Um, and, but you can apply this to any sort of value, like if you have a, a graph that changes over time, or a bar that moves, or a progress bar or something, you could use the same methodology to tween the values that, between updates of, of what you're doing. 
So just to, just to recap on animations with RxJS, the animations are done with, with observables in this case, obviously, because using RxJS observables, again, are just sets of values over time. And animations are sets of values over time. That's why this is a good fit. Uh, you need to deal with two forms of time. Again, you have to deal with frames, which is the instant at which you want to update a position before you render. And you also need to deal with uh, some math around duration and velocity so you can kind of control those things. Um, you use the animation frame schedule in RxJS 5. It's, it's in order to, to get that frame, that, that, that uh, observable of frames, you use animation frame scheduler with interval is my favorite, interval zero, or you can use range from zero to infinity if you like. Because uh, some people just, you know, they get a kick out of using the infinity constant. Um, <laughs> when, do you, when do you get to do that, right? Uh, so, and then the other thing is you want to use a lot of higher order functions to keep these things reusable. So it keeps you from kind of hard coding things. It's, it's not that much more code. It's sometimes even less code to, to do things that way. Uh, so that way you can kind of reuse animations in between different things, like the ball example I showed you with the, where we moved each one in sequence. And most of this, though, again, is just really, really uh, elementary math. It's mostly just a little bit of division, a little bit of addition, a little bit of multiplication. So that's all I've got on animations. Thank you very much.